A very good afternoon to everyone present here. Uh, we are about to commence the session on irradiation with the topic, Unveiling the food Future of Food Preservation, Irradiation Insights. The session is being moderated by Mr. Pradeep Mukherjee, Chief Executive Brit. On our esteemed panel, we have Dr. Saxena, Scientific Officer, Food Technology Division, Bhabha Atomic Research Center, we also have with us Dr. S. Gautam, Head, Food Technology Division, Bhava Atomic Research Center. Our next panelist is Mr. Shantanu Pense, Chief General Manager, State Bank of India. Next, we have with us Dr. Sanjay Rajput, Senior Assistant Director and Chief in Charge, Sri Ram Applied Radiation Center, Sri Ram Institute for Industrial Research. Our next panelist is Mr. Anant Vyas, Director, Simic Engineers, India Private Limited, and Mr. Abhishek Mishra, Director, Sulasa Radiation Unit, Sulasa Industries. I will now hand over to our moderator, Mr. Pradeep Mukherjee, to please begin with the panel. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's a very interesting and important uh, uh, event uh, for this entire uh, World Food India Conference. And uh, we'll be, uh, we are having a very distinguished panelist here, uh, starting from the those who are involved in the last five decades of research on the effect of irrad radiation on food. And uh, we are also having uh, the people who are operating commercially uh, the irradiation facility in India. We also have the people from uh, the manufacturing industry who are actually uh, installing and commissioning, designing, and uh, incubating also uh, the facility, irradiation facility. And the most important part of it, this particular facility requires uh, finance. So we also have the uh, our person from uh, Mr. Shantanu Pense, uh, who is the Chief General Manager of State Bank of India, looking after the agro business. So I think uh, it will be a very interesting uh, session. And uh, um, I understand the kind of crowd we are getting here. So lots of uh, new faces. Uh, and uh, maybe, I mean, some of you must be knowing about that uh, Government of India's initiative that giving uh, uh, grants for 50 additional, uh, 50 more, uh, um, 50 more radiation processing plants. So, Government of India, um, uh, Ministry of Food Processing is providing the funds for it. So, uh, without wasting much of our time, I think uh, first uh, we'll start with first of the technology part of it. Now, uh, uh, as you know, Department of Atomic Energy uh, is the primary organization who has uh, who is carrying out the research for the last five more than five decades. And if you see the history part of it, uh, the first uh, commercial plant uh, indigenously designed uh, by Atomic Energy was installed in the year 2000 at Vashi, commercially. But before that, even in 1974, the first irradiation facility was installed, but that was a, based on a British design. And then there are mo two more irradiators were uh, uh, installed in India. One was in Sriram Institute. Uh, uh, Dr. Sanjay Rajput is there. He will talk about it. And another one is in KMIO uh, in uh, uh, Kidwai Memorial Institute of Oncology in Bangalore. But the first commercially uh, commercially uh, viable uh, plant was installed uh, at Vashi, uh, Navi Mumbai in, uh, uh, in India. And uh, that was specifically meant for the spice irradiation. So, uh, so that's the story. The next onwards, the 2000 onwards for the next 20, 24 years, uh, the technology has been incubated and uh, 
we are proud to say now we are having around 35 odd plants uh, across the country with a designed install capacity in the tune of around 60 million curie of cobalt. Um, so, and the process is very much successful and we'll, we'll, we'll hear it from the people who are operating this plant. And uh, so let us first start with the technology per se. So I'll request uh, Dr. Gautam, uh, from, who is the head of Food Technology Division, uh, Bhava Atomic Research Center, to talk about the technology per se. Uh, as you wish, sir. Dr. Gautam, you try to uh, finish it in uh, 15 minutes' time, so we'll have some uh, time for discussion also. Yeah. on the innovative applications of irradiation in food security and safety. Many of you may be aware of these things. For you, probably it may be the same thing which I told many times. But few, uh, few I can see the new persons are also, and for them this may be very, very important. Like I will tell you success, failure, acceptance, rejection of any technology is the need based. You cannot force any technology to be implemented and acceptance of or deployment of any technology will depend on the need. First thing we have to ask whether we need food radiation technology per se or not. Question is food security. And this situation is going to be tougher uh, day by day, I tell what are the regions. So what are the challenges of the food security? Ability of food for all, that's going to be a challenge with time to come, primarily due to the issue of climate change and so on. Conserving land uses, like hampered by low and declining soil fertility, that's going to be another issue. Harsh climatic conditions add to the problem, like you see the temperature, rising temperature, drought, salinity, frost, flooding, and so on. Conserving water uses is another area, or you can say challenge, that affects the food security. Achieving high yield and productivity. That is because probably after this green revolution, phase one, I will tell you. This has almost reached to the plateau. Productivity or yield has reached to the saturation. But population is increasing, demand is increasing. So how to cater the need? Protecting animal and plant health, because food only talk, depends on, like many countries, they have good amount of animals as a food, like place food and so on. So diseases to the, them, even plants like paste, increase use of agrochemicals, out and outbreak of foodborne diseases, these are the major challenges. Adaptation to climate changes, how to adapt to the climate change. Balancing food and fuel needs, you know that it, this is again another challenge. And a higher cost of food and agriculture inputs. So these are the major challenges for the food security. I will give you in short, just a glimpse, how, how Dep Department of Atomic Energy working uh, since this inception, the peaceful application of nuclear science and technology for the welfare of the society, particularly in the area of food security. So we have worked, try to address both the issues, one the increasing the productivity, other is how to maintain, manage the post-harvest uh, issues. So as for the increasing productivity, you know, India is self-dependent in almost many commodities, like cereals, of course, we have. We have surplus production of wheat, 
rice and so on. But still we import many commodities you may be aware of like pulses and wild seeds. These are the commodities being still imported because our requirement is huge and for that department has taken this as a challenge and BRC has developed 62 crop varieties primarily in the area of wild seed and pulses and all are serving very good, uh, you can say, uses to the farmers. So out of these 62, 28 in the wild seed crops, 24 in pulse crops, 10 in cereal, millet, and fiber crops. And these all we made available to the farmers. Or you can see the rights panel photograph. <coughs> this is a present is pan India almost. And still we are working on developing many more varieties. Now coming to the post-harvest losses. So as the uh, green revolution has happened, phase one I will tell you, where productivity issue was addressed very significantly. Now there is a need of phase two probably to address the post-harvest management. Because there is a limit of increasing productivity, how much one can increase. And so what to do, how, how, how to ensure the food security. So whether post-harvest management gives us a scope where we can address the issue to the significant level. And I will tell you, yes, there is a probability. Region is that about one third of the food is lost or wasted globally. And, uh, and this one third I'm giving an average value, many times even it higher than that is for certain commodity. And when you're talking about loss of a food, it's not only loss of the food per se. You are losing 20% of the global land, 70% of the global water withdrawals, 32% worldwide energy consumption and so on. So indirect losses are also huge. And all this happen at the cost of generating solid waste, greenhouse gases, emissions, and other pollutants. Global food loss and waste generate annually almost 8% of the, you can say, greenhouse gases. And now there's the issue of carbon credit and uh, after climate change, uh, this uh, uh, environmental issues are coming very prominent even worldwide. So food losses is also adding to these issues. So now there's no doubt that we need to certainly address this issue. Now, how to address? I'm coming to it. There are many technology, uh, but one of the technology with the radiation technology, I will tell you. This is basically, if you compare with other technology like heat treatment, they all have limitations. They are limited to certain process product or so on. But this technology becomes, I will tell you, it's also called cold pasteurization because it does not increase the temperature of a commodity. And that's why this can be applied to the many of the commodities. I will show you that. So this technology is the one of the technology which is a very wider range of applications, and that's why it has a promise. Coming to the, for the person who are attending first time this type, on this particular topic, this technology, this construction is very small, you can say simpler thing. You have a, like uh, many experts are here who will tell you subsequently. Like we have a civil structure to certain ceiling requirements so the radiation remain uh, inside the chamber. Then you have a conveyor system to take the product box inside and out. Then you have a water pool where you keep your source and take the source up through some waste mechanism and so on, and a control <laughs> panel. So literally it's a very simple technology to be used, of course, but certain regulations since radiation is involved. And the, this process has started long back, but now cutting the study short, four sources of radiation have been approved for uh, food radiation applications, like two from radioisotope cobalt 60 and cesium 137 and then X-rays and electrons. And right panel, you can see this facility was established by Bhava Atomic Research Center in 1967. And it was established, none other than Dr. Bhava, it was gifted to Dr. Bhava by one of his Canadian friends, uh, Dr. Lewis. What this technology can give you, it can almost address the problem of almost all food community. Not all, but I will tell you almost all. And you can see, that uh, I will come to details also, it can increase the cell life of grains. It can maintain, you can say, uh, inhibit the physiological changes happening in the onions and potato. It can preserve spices. It can also help in overcoming quarantine barrier of trade. And then also self love extension and safety assurance in the case of less foods. Go, as for the government of India, norms in concern, they have almost given blanket approval for almost all food commodity in the eight classes and seven for the allied products. Like you can see this class just to make uh, Things more clear I have put in this form. Like you can eradicate all onion and potatoes, bulb and tuber is the class for them. Re remaining fruits and vegetables, cereal, pulses, even their milk product like atta and so on, nuts, wild seed, dried fruits, fish, seafood and their products, meat, poultry and their products, spices, herb, dry vegetables, dry plant products, dry animal products, even processed products ready to eat, ready to cook and so on. 
Besides various allied products also has been approved like animal food and feed, Ayurvedic hops, packaging material, food additives, health foods and nutraceuticals, body care, cleansing products, can cut flowers. So basically, and all this can be done in one facility, I'm telling you. Only what difference makes, suppose your source strength is high, probably load of application may be issue, but now by putting a split source and so on, uh, that issue can also be undertaken. Uh, so I think next panelist probably uh, highlight on those parts. So, and that's why even what of the proposal government of India has come, they have come with the multi-product food irrigation facility. Now, this is the current status. Uh, we have 30 plus food irrigation facility, but specific to the food, these are 28. Besides, we have some sludge irrigator and so on. So, 28 food irrigation facility as on today. But I will tell you, not in the pan-India presence. Primarily in the western coast, you can see many facilities are there and some in the little northern part. But in the uh, Eastern coast and uh, others uh, very, very, very minuscule. That's why this proposal is required to be brought so that pan-India presence of this facility can be made. Because many times the agriculture community, transportation cost, logistics adds a lot to that. And if your facility is far away from the har harvest point or selling point, then commercial viability with the produce becomes the issue. That's why government has come with the, this proposal. Let's have the facility almost. And this is just the beginning I'm telling you. If this becomes successful, Probably they may come with 100, 200, even coming 500. It depends on how much sufficiently we can provide the cobalt, they can go even 500 facility. Initial proposal like that. But this is the first, they are opening this thing. It depends on the industry, how they can take it up, come forward, and subsequently take this program so that we can have a, almost, time may come probably each district you have one facility, something like that. Maybe lower capacity, but probably it may have. So that depends on how industry responses to that. As you can see, this is the two plant what Seabrit was telling, like, it was established in the right panel, the last uh, Brit facility in 2000 and La Salgao in 2002. Brit was for the hydrogen application and uh, uh, bottom one was for the La Salgao for the low dose application. And this was started by the Department of Atomic Energy. That has culminated with 28 facilities today. Because initially, again, when the concept was approved, who to invest, who is going to invest, department came forward, invested there, set to facility soon. Yes, it is a commercial value. And that resulted in 28 facilities as on today. Now again, government is coming to take this program further ahead. I was setting up 50 more facilities. So now how industry responses depends on that and how they take it up. And we all are there to support the industry from the manufacturing side, from the user side, from science and technology point, whatever way you want. Besides that, we are also doing R&D on many other, like for fish and meat, we require low temperature irrigated. Brit has developed one facility where you can irradiate. Of course, I will tell you it is the semi-commercial, you can say, or pilot scale facility, where you can irradiate meat and fish at very low temperature because they are rich in fat. They often oxidize, so that's why irradiation has to be done very low temperature. And Brit has established that facility. Besides, we are also working on the ELINAC facility at RRCAT in the, there is one of, another being of DAE, and their ELINAC facility has established. Only thing, ELINAC technology completely not, we are independent as on today, but certain community we depend for import, like cholesterol and so on. As compared to that, cobalt 60 is completely indigenous technology. Everything is by DAE, supplying cobalt 60, doing all dose verification, or your approval, etc. Everything but the, within DAE, uh, this thing. But for uh, ELINAC facility, probably we have to depend on certain commodity on the import. That is the issue with that. <coughs> and as per the MOPP speak scheme, I don't know how much government is going to allow the import. Probably I have doubt. But that has to be clarified by the name. Yeah. Now coming to the how, what benefits it can give, I'll give some examples that, like uh, onion case we have done, although it's a very low cost commodity, but we have done, and we have, with the Department of Consumer Affairs and National Cooperative Consumer Federation of India Limited, last year we did around 1,200 tons of onion, it was very well preserved up to seven to eight months, in certain control conditions. <coughs> and after, subsequently made a cold storage to demonstrate the technology of last year. And it's still 250 tons of onion has been stored there, full capacity, by one of the FPO. Potato, this technology is also very important. I, many must, you may be aware of that, like European Union, they don't allow CIPC to be treated on the potato. So potato, this technology is very good. After irradiation, you can store at temperature of higher 14 degrees Celsius and so, and keep up to eight months. So that advantage, and this is very good for the processing type of potatoes, because it does not become sweeter, and they're good for the frying and so on. And I will tell you, this is the radiation, like world food, uh, this, uh, you can see the global potato processing market is increasing very exponentially. And radiation processing has excellent potential to retain the processing quality of a stored potato. 
So this is the area probably we need to rotate. And why we have not succeeded? Because cold storage technology is very much successful as on today for the potato. So people are least bother why to irradiate. But this, but this is very good for processing type of potato. Like you know, many PepsiCo other they are doing contact farming and storing potato and so on. So for those type of potato, this technology is excellent. You are going to save energy also. You are going to protect quality also. Mango, I think many of us have heard. This is one of the successful story of the radiation technology. We are exporting mango to USA, Australia, now also Malaysia and South Africa. Of course, the quantum is less. But uh, if you have the more low dose radiation facility, probably this quantum will go up. And uh, we also did the seaweed shipment so that and uh, that freight co uh, cost can be reduced, and it was successful. Serial impulses, I will tell you, uh, many times, all this, even like uh, different government agencies involved, even private sector, they are involved in storing these grains. They are bound to use fumigants because there's no other solution for that. Otherwise, it, it, the, this is going to spoil. You can see the left side of the community. And uh, they're going to spoil by in, in insect infestation. But if you do <laughs> radiation processing, you can tackle. But what are the challenges here? Major challenge, the volume is very huge. Even FCI is storing 400 million tons of the wheat. So whether our plants are capable to treat those much of volume of produce, that is still a challenge. And irradiation uh, time Dr. has Gautam, to be... Another two minutes. Sir, yes, I'm com completing. And that has to be uh, you aligned with the, you can say, um, harvest time and the season of the uh, produce. So that, that is a big challenge. But if you can succeed, this can be a very effective alternative to the gaseous fumigation that is known to have adverse effect on health and environment. This technology can also give many like tomatoes, broccoli, and so on. I'm just showing you some photographs. Even uh, many times, which is not only safety assurance, they also do value addition. Like in the case of sprouts, they reduce the anti-nutritional factor. So that is, a value, that is a value addition to the product. Spices, again, that is the one success story for the radiation because most of the facility as in today, they are doing spices as far the food is concerned. You don't require any fumigation, one time treatment. Compared to fumigation, that is required to be in almost three to four times in a year of the story. And no chemical residue in this produce. This is a large side from my side. Many times people, what are other business you can do? Like bakery products, I will give you one example. Here you can preserve up to 10 to 12 days after digestion processing. And there are 22% of the bakery products are lost because their self life, you can say retail life is very, very small. And by, suppose you can preserve this much, how much business one can <coughs> develop out of it. Many products we have developed at BRC, you can say ready to eat product for, the, for exotic fruits or you can say very seasonal fruits. And that can, even some of the products are available in a, uh, some self here also. Place foods also, this is a very good technology. And already I have told you the low temperature area which it has developed. With this, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Gautam. I think. Uh, We'll take up the questions. Uh, please keep it note down. Uh, we'll finish off uh, the round of uh, talk and then we'll take up the questions. Uh, so the next speaker is uh, Dr. Saxena, uh, who is from Food Technology Division, once again from BARC. Uh, he will talk about the ensuring uh, nutritional integrity uh, through irradiation. As you know, compared to the other processes like fumigation, uh, uh, drying uh, and the other processes which is uh, uh, heating, freezing, some chemical process. So all these things, uh, there are maybe some losses of flavor, losses of aroma, uh, or maybe the presence of some toxic substance also. So since, uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Gautam has already uh, conveyed, there is a cold pasteurization process and no, no, no chemicals is added. So it is a preservation without preservative. So uh, now, Dr. Sakshina, please uh, uh, have your talk. Thank you, sir. Uh, respected all, a very good afternoon to you. So the topic of my presentation is ensuring nutritional integrity of food through irradiation. So this is basically an extension of the earlier presentation made by respected head food technology division, and uh, wherein he advocated about the different technical aspects and the socioeconomic implications of food irradiation. My talk is more confined on the safety aspects and the nutritional retention aspect of uh, food irradiation. So when we talk about the nutritional integrity, the first and the foremost thing we should understand is what is a nutrient. So according to the Food Safety and the Standards Labeling and Display Regulations 2020, nutrient means a constituent of food which provides energy, like we have proteins, carbohydrates, fats. Then we 
it has some specific metabolic and physiological functions and is needed for the overall growth and, and development of the body. So the question comes, what happens to the nutritional integrity of any food which is subjected to radiation processing? Quite often we come across this question when we go for any kind of outreach or awareness program because here the radiation which is being used is an ionizing radiation. So the when, whenever any term is associated with radiation, it's quite alarming. People try to think, oh, oh what next is going to happen? So I will try to uh, provide some insight on that aspect. So this is basically our electromagnetic spectrum. And if you can see, the right end of the electromagnetic spectrum comprises of ultraviolet, X-rays, and gamma rays. So the component is spanning from part of UV to entire X-rays and gamma rays. They are principally ionizing in radiation. They are having this special attribute of causing ionization, and their frequency ranges from about 10 raised to 15 to 10 raised to 10, uh, 21 hertz. So now, <clears throat> I have typically taken the example of cobalt-60, as Sir mentioned in his presentation, that we have some approved sources for food irradiation applications. So in as far as radioisotopes are concerned, we have cobalt-60 and cesium-137. And as far as machine sources are concerned, we have electron beam and x-rays. So as far as our own country is concerned, so whatever food irradiation facilities are there in our country, 28 facilities, the workhorse is cobalt-60. So let me familiarize you with cobalt-60. Cobalt-60 is not a naturally occurring radioisotope. It is made from cobalt-59 through neutron irradiation. So among the developing countries, India has mastered the art of producing cobalt-60 in nuclear power reactors. So what is being done in simplified terms, cobalt-59 is put inside nuclear power reactors for a certain period of time. After attending some specific activity, it is taken out, and then it is fabricated into pencils. You can see in the panel some cobalt pencils are there, and these are, uh, uh, these are put in a frame, and this entire frame is lost, is put in pool of water. So this is how it is uh, kept in, uh, uh, in storage. And this is the decay scheme of cobalt-60. You can see cobalt-60 decays to nickel-60, and its half-life of cobalt-60 is 5.27 years. During this decay process, it emits two, ga two, uh, energy, uh, two gamma ray photons of energies 1.17 and 1.33 MeV. So we have to remember that these are soft energies, 1.17 and 1.33 energies. We are harnessing the potential of this energy for our food irradiation applications. So the activity of the isotope is uh, depicted in terms of Curie but when ionizing radiation uh, impinges on any food, so certain amount of radiation dose is offered to the food, or basically energy is deposited, so it is equated in terms of gray. So for all the food irradiation applications, we talk in terms of gray, where one gray is one joule per kg. Now, we have objective specific importance of food irradiation, and I'm going to show you the impact of the nutritional profile. So categorically, we have classified the different applications into three different categories. One is the low-dose application, second is the medium-dose application, and third is the high-dose application. So as I told you, depending upon the radiation-absorbed dose, the applications are categorized like this. So if, if any food commodity is receiving less than 1,000 gray, less than 1 kilo gray, this application is termed as low-dose application. So likewise, if any commodity is receiving between 1 to 10 kilogray, it is termed as medium dose. And if it is receiving more than 10 kilogray for attaining certain other objective, it is termed as high dose application. So now, as Sir pointed about the, uh, uh, this rising potato industry and the importance of potato processing, so now as far as our own country is concerned, whatever potatoes are preserved in our uh, storages, they are preserved in cold storages, and that through the usage of chemical sprout inhibitors. And one of the foremost chemical sprout inhibitor that which is being used is CIPC, chlorpropharm. It's an herbicide, it's a carbamate ester. So European Union has banned its usage since January 2020. But in our country, it is still being used. So what are the other demerits of keeping potato in the cold storage, say between 5 to 10 degrees centigrade? Cold induced sweetening takes place. Aapka alu mitha ho jata hai. So when you take these potatoes for processing, it turns brown. So it's not good for the processing industry. At the same time, so we uh, did a 
trial with uh, with a commercial uh, with a industry partner and wherein we uh, did this study with 28 tons of potato taking into account three different commercial potato cultivars you can see the left this uh, left one this is a, a non irradiated potatoes so within 100 days of storage at 14 degrees centigrade complete sprouting took place in all the potatoes and say after 6 months or 7 months of time this condition further worsened you can see on the entire surface of the potatoes complete sprouting is there so and on the right side of the panel you can see the irradiated ones marked with a redura symbol and you can see potatoes are completely sprout free even after 8 months of storage and this is the pictorial representation of the chips prepared from those potatoes so now coming down to the important aspect what is what happens to the nutritional profile of the potatoes so of course we took three different potash uh, this commercial cultivars so i am just showing the one of the representatives uh, this is lady rosetta uh, potato samples you can see uh, on the left side we have non irradiated panel and on the right side we have irradiated panel control samples didn't last more than 100 days because the sprouting took place therefore we did not do any nutritional profiling but irradiated samples kept on uh they were uh, you know completely retained even after 8 months of storage so this data is uh, around 20, 240 days you can see the energy carbohydrate protein and fats more or less they were retained throughout the entire storage period and there was no significant change between the non irradiated and the irradiated samples you can see on the day 0 and day 90 so and incidentally we also published though we had uh, limited information as to how radiation is leading to sprouting inhibition but we uh, did a comprehensive study we did transcript uh, transcriptome profiling and we deciphered the mechanism involved in the in the sprouting inhibition by radiation processing and this article has come in nature scientific reports titled differential gene expression in irradiated potato tubers contributed to sprout inhibition and quality retention during a commercial scale storage now the other important aspect which sir told about the post harvest losses in food grains so you can see this is the panel showing the uh, you know how radiation can beautifully preserve the grains so the left panel you can see uh, say after 3 or 4 months time so uh, this insect pests is start deteriorating your uh, grains and say after a year storage if it is not subjected to any kind of fumigation complete loss of grains takes place not only qualitatively but quantitatively but on the extreme right panel if you see if you are treating with radiation dose say around 650 grade d minimum the the quality and quantity is uh, remains intact so this is the nutritional profile of those potato uh, this uh, wheat sample uh, this uh, wheat samples you can see the energy protein fat carbohydrates moisture ash and dietary uh, fiber you can see we have non irradiated first month then irradiated first month irradiated 6 months and irradiated 12 months so hardly you will find any kind of you know significant difference uh, between the non irradiated and the non irradiated ones and incidentally we also did the protein profile because wheat is also a hub of uh, you know important storage protein so we did some swath ms this is a high end analysis so we got to know that uh, the protein profile uh, remained intact so can you share the dose range yeah i will share now the importance of radiation technology in uh, uh, in value chain for fruits and vegetables as we all know that india is the second largest producer of fruits and vegetables but at the same time india witnesses losses to the tune of 5 to 16% wastage in fruits and vegetables sector is incurred and uh, if we see the other counterparts like united states malaysia france where the processing level is more than 70 to 80% Thailand 30%, Australia 20 20%, but in India the level of processing is just 2%. So now this is a typical example that how we can uh, develop a chemical preservative free product from perishable commodities. So this is made from a uh, jamun. Jamun, as we all know, that's it's a summer fruit and it's highly perishable. It's available only for one or two months time. And if you uh, or uh, make a dehydrated product of it and saves it it has a higher moisture content more than 15% or so so in a month or so it undergoes fungal spoilage and if you do not add any chemical preservative just add irradiation just give 5 kg dose of radiation this is completely preserved and uh, it will be retained even up till 5 to 6 months of storage so there is a dedicated stall also by our licensee who took this technology and he is selling the product i think the stall number will be 92 so here also i have highlighted that uh, energy protein fats and carbohydrate you can see we have non irradiated column and we have irradiated say day 1 and and after the completion of 5 months there is hardly any change in the energy value 
protein value, fat, or carbohydrate. So this, in simplistic terms, we can say that by radiation, the nutritional wholesomeness is maintained. So we also published this, uh, both uh, these papers. So, and we also uh, made one product from strawberry. Strawberry is a winter fruit, and it's also highly perishable. So our product has also been made from strawberry. So we have some publications out of it. Dr. Saxena, another two minutes. Yeah, last. So we have uh, this uh, stuffed baked food. This is also a relief food made by DA. You can see the nutritional property is uh, maintained. And uh, this paper was published in LWT Food Science and Technology. Then uh, this, uh, we also did uh, some safe microbial safety assurance study with the Tata Memorial Hospital on an enteral feed. Because the immunocompromised patients, for them, we require a completely microbiologically sterile or microbiologically safe food. So enteral food was prepared. And say, there around 10 kilogram dose of was given. And even after that, you can see the nutritional property remains intact. Then we can also attain value addition, like in herbals. Herbals, you know that if you keep for longer storage of time, it undergoes caking problem. But if you give radiation, you can be sure that it will stay uh, you know, wholesome even after one year or so. So this, we, this study we did with Bhui Avala, Phylanthus Nuriri. You can see the antioxidant activity increased, and uh, this phenolic content also increased. In Rajma, even up to 10 kg dose of radiation can improve its cooking properties. Now the other component is what about the safety of the food from radioactivity point of view. This is something very important. So as I told you, the isotopes that we are using or the machine sources we are using, the energy that comes out from those sources, these are very soft radiation. This is not... Uh, this is hard towards the spoilage microorganism, but it is soft towards the food. And uh, let me tell you that it is incapable of creating any kind of disturbance in the nucleus of the atoms that, uh, uh, that uh, represent the elements of any food matrix. Say if you take any food, like uh, it contains oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen. So if you see the binding energy of these elements, it's very, very high. And at the same time, if you see the energy coming from cobalt-68, it's just 1.17 MeV. And binding energy of nitrogen, say it's around 15 MeV. So it is incapable of creating any kind of disturbance at the nucleus of the, uh, these elements. So therefore, radiation processing through these uh, modalities cannot make the food radioactive. So, and moreover, uh, long back, uh, some safety studies were also done by United States, U.S. Army. So this is a very important RALTEC study. This was an eight-year study spanning from 1976 to 1984, wherein 135 tons of chicken meat was used, and it was fed to different laboratory animals like mice, hamsters, and rats. No incidence of any genetic toxicity or mutagenic effects was noticed. And parallelly, uh, recently we have also, uh, you know, did some R&D on this aspect, wherein we uh, developed some bacterial model and cell line systems. And we, and this paper published in Journal of the Science of Food and Agriculture and International Journal of Radiation Biology. So now coming to the last slide. So WHO has come up with a, a very good report, and that says. Safety and Nutritional Adequacy of Irradiated Food. And I have highlighted a segment of this uh, report. It's a thoroughly tested technique and that it has not been shown to have any deleterious effects when performed in accordance with GMP. Now, our, in India also, our own Food Safety and the Standards Authority of India has come up with a guidance note which says irradiated food is completely safe, busting myths around it. And uh, of course, uh, a revised version is also due to come in, uh, uh, in the coming time. And there is a fact sheets on food irradiation by an international consultative group on food irradiation, wherein different myths are cleared. And many international statutory bodies have accorded approval to this technology. So with this, I conclude. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saxena, for enlightening us uh, with, the, uh, with the basic uh, uh, fear what we what we are having that rado symbol it can i mean the irradiation creates uh, induced activity in the food so uh, thank you very much for clearing the doubts that gamma energy is such soft that particular cobalt 60 gamma energy it cannot displace the nu uh, nucleus uh, so it is absolutely impossible to induce radioactivity inside the food after irradiation so thank you very much so the next one uh, uh, is the um, from uh, Mr. Santanu Pense, uh, who will be actually uh, from State Bank of India. 
uh, and uh, he will be talking about uh, the banking on uh, food security, the strategic importance of investing in irradiation. Okay, okay, fine, 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 fine. I, I think that will be a better one. So uh, may I request and then, then uh, Dr. Sanjay Rajput, uh, uh, Sridham Institute. Uh, so he will be talking about, as I told, uh, uh, Sridham Institute was, uh, it was established one uh, gamma irradiation facility somewhere in 1990s beginning. And uh, lots of R&D activities uh, has been carried out on the uh, food irradiation technologies in Sridham Institute. So Dr. Rajput yes, can... Uh, can elaborate those R&D processes, whatever, what R&D activities, whatever has been carried out there. Good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Gautam Rakhsaksana has already explained all the various benefits of the gamma radiation. Uh, actually, we at Shriram Institute for Industrial Research Delhi, we are working uh, in association with the BRC and uh, Brit uh, Food Technology Division especially on uh, radiation of food products. And uh, we, have, we also have one radiation processing plant in uh, North Delhi for installation of healthcare products. So our, we, but at the same time, we do a lot of research on food products. And uh, we are doing this herbal Ayurvedic product also for various purposes. So that uh, the benefits, various benefits are said with the food radiation is already explained. And this uh, radiation technology is basically purpose-based, which uh, Dr. Gautam and Dr. Saktana has already explained. So it can be used for, uh, on purpose base, basically which purpose, uh, for which purpose you are going to use it. So you have to decide. So accordingly, it can be utilized for various applications. And again, this dose base, low dose for various purpose and medium dose and the high dose. Then there are also limitations for food processing. So uh, I would like to tell the public and all the uh, these participants here that all type of food cannot be processed through radiation technology. So you have to see that, like uh, if it is spoiled, it's highly contaminated, so it is not possible, to, uh, we should avoid that thing. So we have to see the stages, like in case of fruits. So there's a stage, like at the time of maturity, <coughs> once it is ripened, then it, the pro that particular self enhancement you may not achieve further. So you have to see the stage, at which stage, Food, uh, this fruit is available. Then, of course, dairy products are there. It's not possible. Then, uh, like pesticide, chemicals, viruses, it is not possible to remove through radiation. And, of course, there's increased cost. But at the same time, it has a, if it is used with a, some other, along with other techniques, so synergistic effect can be achieved. Like, uh, the one food product is there, and uh, at a particular dose, it affects the, some property of there, but at the same time, lower dose, it's, it's okay. So you, what you can do, you can use the, uh, some other technique, like uh, blanching, bo uh, boiling, and other, uh, heat treatment, and then along with that, you can use the radiation technology. So in that case, it is very successful. So synergistic effect you can achieve through radiation technology. This uh, is already conveyed, this various categories of the food which are permitted by the FSCCI, the guidelines are there for various purposes, different doses. So here I would like to share uh, our experiences with the radiation processing of food, food product for uh, different purposes. Like uh, we worked on self-extension of apple. This project we uh, worked along with us. Of course, this was sponsored by Ministry of Food Processing Industries, Government of India, and that we did uh, long back, and then uh, bamboo shoot is one uh, uh, product which has very high value for antioxidant, thus disinfestation of spices, wheat flour, pulses, gram, dehydrated vegetables, herbal product, uh, 
wheat, wheat products and the removal of aflatoxin peanuts. So various uh, research projects we had undertaken on irradiation of food products. So just I will explain about the outcome of this uh, irradiation of apple. What happens this uh, apple is a basically climatic fruit and it is ripened during storage. Ripening takes place in storage and uh, this ripening uh, uh, duration of the ripening is dependent on the temperature storage condition. So it has a, some limitations like you can uh, store for three months, four months like this. So our aim was to just to increase this, uh, this uh, shelf life by just retarding the ripening process. So this is one technique by which low dose application. This is a totally low dose application. So what we did, we radiated various type of apples from this Himachal and, the, and the Jammu and Kashmir. And this was in association with the Sere Kashmir University, this project. And uh, what we did, we processed uh, this uh, apple in bulk at uh, in the range of 0.25 to 0.7 kilogram, which, which is very low dose. And after addition processing, it was stored for uh, uh, nine months during the uh, for this uh, storage condition of 95 to 95 percent humidity and four degree temperature, which is the recommended temperature for storage of the apple. Then at the same time, uh, we use the ambient condition also. And various parameters were evaluated, like physio physiochemical properties, sensory properties, mainly for taste, texture, aroma, using nine point hedonic scale. Then uh, microbiological evaluation was also done for surface. Because at the way, this low dose, it is not going to remove the all biological aspect. Then uh, what, it, uh, what it works actually, this at the time of maturity, it has uh, some starch content in the uh, apple. So at the time of maturity, when it is uh, subjected to gamma radiation, it has a starch uh, like uh, sugar content is there. So what we did, this, the, what we found actually, this, the conversion of the starch of sugar is basically retarded, delayed, which is responsible for the ripening. So this ripening process is delayed due to this. Uh, Enzymatic process, which is responsible for uh, ripening of the apple, so that is affected and this uh, delayed by three to four months ripening process. And of course, the temperature condition is the same. Otherwise, if we don't keep the, 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 that condition, so it will lose some uh, juice content and other parameters. So we got uh, this uh, result like uh, irradiated apples had as uh, continuously this uh, increasing the sugar content up to eight months. So this shows that uh, ripening of this uh, apple is delayed. This conversion of starch to sugar is delayed. And at the same time, we also did this study of irradiated apple at ambient condition, 15 degree, which is reduced, of course, because that uh, favorable storage condition is not there, the 15. Favorable condition is a 4 degree centigrade and 90 to 95 percent humidity. That is the favorable condition for storage so that it can be retained all the properties. So th this is uh, basically the uh, golden variety of this apple. We tried on Royal Delicious, Red Delicious, Golden, various types of varieties we took from Jammu Kashmir and the Himachal. And uh, what we observed, just see, then this uh, these uh, golden apples are green in color initially. Even the color is retained. The ripening the, of this uh, uh, process is delayed, delayed three to four months. Similarly, just the same thing. Now, this is a raw delicious. So it was uh, basically three months of storage in ambient condition is completely uh, decayed took place, spoiled. So this outcome of this uh, study clearly so that uh, this uh, gamma radiation processing can enhance the shelf life of apple by uh, three to four months. <laughs> then after uh, uh, getting this uh, data, what we did, uh, we, along with the State Bank of India, this uh, uh, Punjab is Chandigarh, under this UPTEC project. So we did the pilot study along with them and uh, along with the archivist at Himachal, various places. And we had organized uh, these conferences and we did the, this uh, sensory evolution of irradiated apple along with the unirradiated apples. And uh, 
nobody was able to identify the with regard to taste texture and aroma so which one is uh, irradiated and which one is non irradiated so th that is the exercise we did on this under project of tech of sbi so that was a success story of this apple irradiation for self life enhancement then uh, we also did uh, self extension of uh, various other uh, product like lychee we did along with the uh, jb pant agriculture university and uh, uh, this uh, uh, this lychee has a very short shelf life and after addition processing it can be stored for 24 days with the same uh, uh, properties sensory uh, we also did sensory evolution for appearance taste texture and uh, this uh, finding was published in international journal of radiation physics and chemistry we also did uh, i just want to show about the the effectiveness of the radiation technology how effective is this for reduction of the microbiological load while maintaining the other important properties so that experience we have and uh, we are doing it for so many two last two three decades we are doing it on this type of job so this just see the effectiveness at different radiation doses it uh, it uh, reduces the microbiological load significantly that is the effectiveness of the radiation dose then we did on various type of herbal product we are doing a lot of herbal products because herbal is one uh, as per the practice uh, it goes through various stages so lot of contamination microbial contamination takes place during this uh, uh, stages so and we found that 5 uh, kg dose is good enough to take care of the all type of microbiological load and range of uh, herbal product we did and this study we did uh, under this uh, along with the brc food technology division dr arun sharma at that time was the head of food technology division at brc so we did along with them then bamboo shoot we did at uh, 22.5 kg dose was found to be optimized dose for uh, enhancement of the self life of this bamboo and which which can go up to 240 days otherwise self life is very poor and it is used in various uh, food product and it has a very high uh, uh, dr sanjay content. another 2 minutes okay so i will just skip then then the dehydrated carrots <coughs> then we also did uh, some study on aflatoxin removal in the peanuts actually and uh, at 8 kg dose is completely removal of the aflat aflatoxin took place and without affecting various uh, these uh, properties now we come to the safety aspect of the irradiated food as already dr sena has already uh, shared the it has in the last 5 decades more than 5 decades this food irradiation uh, irradiated food have been evaluated for various radiological safety safety of the chemical changes micro safety toxicological and nutritional adequacy and uh, long back uh, this uh, fao who and iaea that recommended 10 kg is a blanket they have given as a safe dose which is very high we are discussing 0.2 0.5 so even at 10 kg dose food is safe you could for radiation so we can do the food processing at i mean 10 kg even at high dose even 25 kg is also used for a specialized <coughs> application for slicing of food item for a specialized application so as far as safety is concerned it is totally safe and so many countries are already approved in, along with the india so many range of food has been approved so these are the, uh, of course the regulatory requirements are there if a product is processed through radiation one has to go for this symbol and it you have to mention that it, it is treated by gamma radiation there is a requirement regulatory requirement now this one issue is the consumer acceptability of the irradiated food actually so we have to basically see that uh, due to the lack of the awareness about the safety aspect of irradiated food we have to convey for this uh, about the safety and once the truthful importance about the irradiated food comes it will be established and and crazy result of the market trial have led the successful introduction of irradiated food in various countries actually so now way forward is basically irradiation provide a added layer of the safety to many food products recent trends indicate that irradiation can play important role to control the post harvest losses leading to of course this food safety and food security dr gautam is already shared and due to the strict uh, content regulation like uh, there is a uh, guidelines for content treatment like uh, the success story dr gautam just explained about the irradiation of food 
so like so many countries they don't accept uh, uh, these agriculture produce or fruits and vegetables if it is not processed through gamma radiation this mango is one story it has to be processed through gamma radiation only then you can export so for the trade barrier it is a very go good technology for the growth of the export or the economy of the con any country so it is a, it, one has to look for that aspect also and more awareness program of the safety and the benefits of radioactive food should be created on the among the consumers so that it can be exploited on a larger scale actually. And R&D projects should be undertaken to enlarge the list of the food uh, products so that it can be, uh, and more, more and more product can be processed. So research projects has to be undertaken for that. And this will certainly increase the use of radiation for various purposes. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Sanjay, for highlighting the, your uh, commendable work on apples. And as you have indicated, the mango is another success story, the quarantine barriers uh, for removal. And in the uh, for last four or five years, we are doing the mango export to Canada, I mean, the USA and Australia. And uh, this year, actually, more than 2,500 or 3,000 tons of mangoes are exported to uh, the uh, exported to USA. And that's a really, really a good uh, op business opportunity for all those people who are in the export of the mangoes. <coughs> so our next speaker is uh, Mr. Uh, Anand Vas. And Anand Vas is uh, basically from Cymic Engineers who are actually building this uh, radiation processing facility. So there are a lot of innovations has taken place uh, starting from 2000 onwards. Uh, the incubation process. In fact, they are the uh, they are the people who have done this incubation process throughout this uh, entire journey. Now we have a very established technology, and it will be pretty easy for any one of us, any one of you who wants to invest money on building a radiation processing plant. So we have the ready-made technology available for us. So over to uh, Anand. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you to all my fellow panelists uh, for their lovely and very informative talk so far, which helped us really set the context for what we're here today. Uh, so my company is Cymec Engineers India Private Limited, and we are uh, in a very different part of the supply chain for this particular technology. We are the manufacturers of the plant and machinery. So we look at it from an engineering perspective purely. We are also well aware of the process parameters, and uh, for us, our main goal is to find the optimal solution required by the market to make this technology successful. So our company essentially builds industrial gamma irradiation plants apart from other, uh, other uh, machinery and systems, and we have been in this industry since the 1990s. Now, uh, just to set a small background to everybody here, uh, India, as we all know, has a very large and vast agricultural processing sector, and there are many key products, food and agricultural products. Irradiation as a technology has also been here for a long time. And these products are both white, the food products I was mentioning, are both vital for the national and for the global food security and supply chain. Now, all of us have seen, uh, with the Ukraine war and other things going on, how fragile food security is worldwide. One small thing happening in the other corner of the world can suddenly make food prices shoot up in our own country. So it is very important that we have food security and food safety. What does this mean? It means that all the food that we grow, we should be able to preserve and keep carefully for our own people. And this food should be of the best possible nutritional and uh, physiological quality. Now, this is a bit challenging because in countries like India, we have varying crop yields, different climatic conditions, spoilage and wastage due to improper packaging and storage harvest, uh, sorry, post-harvest infrastructure and lack of logistics regulatory framework for movement and transport of these products. Now, irradiation as a technology can solve many of these problems. It can't solve some of these problems and it can solve many of these problems. And for many of these problems, it can be solved when coupled with another storage technology. So it's not a simple you know, magic wand which you can wave. So as designers, as plant designers, it's very important for us to understand this. So uh, the reason why innovations are required when we talk about food, why can't we simply use the existing plant designs, is because all the existing plant designs were designed to cater to the existing market. Now this technology has been around for a while, as I mentioned. When it came to India, it was primarily designed for medical devices. Uh, then later on it entered into spices, herbal products, pet food, then mangoes came along. Each of these products was a watershed movement. Before these products were introduced and done, people just felt it could not be done easily. 
Now, India is very lucky in that now the technology is fully indigenous, 100% make in India, and it has been 100% make in India for a while. And the plants that we are building today are ideal for the products which are being processed in large volumes today. But when we speak of food, especially when we speak of perishable food, like, for example, uh, Dr. Gautam, Dr. Saxena, Dr. Rajput, everybody talked about the different perishable foods, like we spoke about potatoes, onions, cereals, food grains, pulses. The current plant designs are not optimal for this because they were never really designed considering the problems that they have to solve for this. So the plant design has to cater to this if we are ever to make food irradiation successful in a large scale in our country. So uh, one of the things which happens is that we are currently designed, we are, we are currently working with plants that are designed to treat products in packaging because most of the products we're doing right now come in packages. But when we speak of food grains, when we speak about agro products, they are mostly in bulk. They're, they come to the mandi in bulk, they're handled in bulk. And also, unlike medical devices, spices mm -hmm. and all that, these are highly perishable and prone to damage due to handling and so on. So as designers, we need to consider this because if we don't design that part of it into our system, then the whole uh, proposition may get destroyed because of that. So our goal in the last few years has been to design systems for integrated bulk irradiation. This is something which we have been focusing on a lot. Uh, luckily, we got a very good opportunity to do that for a very different product, which is not a food product, which is for municipal sewage sludge, which is a new application. But that gave us a lot of information on how to design for food as well, and that is something which we are working on now, wherein we design the system to handle grains uh, or potatoes and onions in bulk, also integrate the other processes, including cleaning, sieving, crushing, destoning, and other parts of it, and then do fixed weight uh, loading into to our tote boxes, irradiation, and then after that, seamless transfer and integration with the storage infrastructure. If we do this, we eliminate the damage due to handling, we eliminate the cost due to handling, and we try to minimize the transportation cost. These three are big issues in agro-irradiation, which are not part of the current plant designs. So have, by having an integrated approach, we essentially try to co-locate all the facilities because uh, unlike medical products, spices, which are very high-value products, where even if you were to transport it from Mumbai to uh, Bangalore, for example, the cost is not very significant. It is well within the product's economics. But for agro products, it is not the case. So co-locating the infrastructure. By infrastructure, what do I mean? Uh, when the product comes, it has to be first handled. There has to be pre-processing done, then irradiation, and then storage. If all of these are in the same place, then irradiation suddenly becomes a very viable uh, processing because the cost of processing itself for irradiation of agro products is pretty low compared to medical and other products because it's in large volumes. So we're talking about 14 tons per hour, which can even be scaled up to 30 tons per hour. So in those volumes, the per kg cost is not very significant. By co-locating it with the other infrastructure, we eliminate the handling and the other damages, and that makes it much more viable. So we have uh, done a lot of work in uh, uh, achieving an integrated approach, achieving a much higher throughput, and a higher shelf life and better quality of the products that we are taking care of. By doing this, uh, we ensure that we are giving the best possible solution for the problem at hand. Another thing is we also deal with a lot of temperature sensitive products, which you know, in, in other countries like Vietnam and others, a lot of frozen seafood is irradiated and exported to countries like the US. It is a multi-billion dollar market. But in India, we repeatedly see headlines that Indian shipments are being rejected because of presence of bacteria, salmonella, E. coli, uh, and other such things. So irradiation is a good solution for that. But the problem is the current plants cannot do temperature sensitive products. So we came up with a good solution for that, wherein we created uh, insulated tote boxes, which could be then retrofitted into the existing plants and maintain temperature for these temperature sensitive products for up to 12 hours. So the whole process can be done without having to build new plants, but essentially using the existing plants. So this is another thing which we have been working on for a while, and we have got quite good results. And the last part, which I mentioned earlier, was high volume processing. So for here, in many countries, uh, the way they do high volume processing is to use palletization. In India, it is not very commonly used. So as manufacturers, it is a challenge for us to come up with a solution for this. One way of doing it is to create an automated palletizing and depalletizing system, wherein we can integrate the palletization with the main loading and loading conveyors of the irradiation plant. This allows us to significantly scale up the volumes that we process and makes it a much more viable and uh, suitable uh, process for agro-irradiation. So yeah, I mean, this is basically it. This is a very brief presentation I had today to just talk about all this. Uh, if anybody has any other questions, we can address them later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Anand, for a very uh, precise and to the point uh, uh, presentation. So uh, without wasting much time, uh, 
Let us now invite uh, Mr. Abhishek Mitra of, from, from Solas Indigestion uh, uh, Unit. Uh, so they are, uh, they are uh, the people who are actually operating the plant. So he will be able to give the, his experience about operating these plants. Thank you, uh, C. Britt, uh, sir, for inviting all of us to be present. It's an uh, eye opener for many uh, newcomers also. So uh, before starting is, I am the product of MOF uh, 2017. So first I uh, attended this World Food India and I came about the technology. And I'm a byproduct, you can say, of World Food India. So uh, going ahead, I will make my uh, discussion more or about uh, practicality of this project. Because we discussed about the R&D, research, installation, finance. But everything took place if business is there. So sustainability. So how it will achieve? So two, three slides I'm going through. Uh, so it's just a brief about the my plant. So my plant is currently uh, running on completely on solar. And capacity is uh, highest in the in UP and all. So we come to the main slide. So what I uh, try to show here is, so initial first year, the source loading capacity and maximum volume we can do uh, to achieve uh, the next uh, slide, which is mainly deal with the finance part. So we can is keep on is increasing the source by 100 KCI every uh, year, 50 first and then 100. And we can able to achieve supported by the industry and the other bank uh, bulk handlers. Then only we can uh, do these numbers. So if you break it down, those spices, uh, pulses, green, mango, fruits, and onion irradiation. So currently, I can say among these, I'm currently doing uh, spices and uh, dry fruits and dehydrated vegetables. So next slide, actually, the current market with the rate per ton, which is currently going through it. So uh, uh, <coughs> year by year, the annual revenue you can see it's move if subjected to the if we get the rate as per these uh, slides so next slide will be actually going to make more uh, useful to understand the finance part of this project so if we do subject to do this uh, volumes and with that rate <coughs> we can generate revenue of uh, year by year like this and uh, Cash flow, if you say, the next line. So most important for any business is ROI. So return on investment, uh, if we do by doing these numbers, will come in six and seven years. So ministry actually helping us to reduce this ROI to three to four years. So why I'm focusing on this slide? Because take subsidy as a support, anyone who's want to willing to go ahead ultimately why we are here we are here to uh, taking it to next level if ministry is aggressive and want to be set up these plants uh, you must uh, understand that return on investment with the support of ministry can only reduce the your roi to two to three years it's nothing like that you got the subsidy and you know you can do the business so lots of opportunity in the market so because everything is discussed regarding technology and uh, R&D and the research. So I will, three slide I will complete. First one will be going to be opportunities. The next I'm going to discuss the challenges and I'm suggest, I will going to suggest the solutions for that also. So opportunities, huge, I must say, because market of cereal grains and millets are untapped. As you, sir said, all the research are with us. But bulk handling is still not happening in India. Spice market already uh, blasted because a uh, lot of rejection in Singapore and all because of uh, uh, fumigation, high, high rated fumigation happened. ETO happened and it detected in the spices. They got rejected. The company got banned in many countries. And it's not only about banning the com uh, uh, companies. Actually, it's hampering India image at global level. So we must address aggressively on that. So and. Uh, Many currently US FDA and NPO approved faculties, facilities for mango as another fruit vegetables required in different parts of the country. Currently, it's mainly situated in uh, Maharashtra, Mumbai, and one in Gujarat. So Pranav is here, and he's one of the 
pioneer in handling uh, onions and uh, mangoes. Uh, so these kind of more uh, facilities needed in India. Opportunities is there. Herbal products and tea market is still untapped. Why are you saying untapped? The herbal products currently we are doing very less in numbers. So ton-wise, monthly is 100 ton max, or 200, 250 tons, uh, including all, all the herbal products. And again, a huge market is bulk handling of onion and potatoes. So opportunities is there, why are not doing it? The next question. So what are the challenges? Challenges actually is very practical. I try to make in uh, four and five points. So number one is what already discussed is customer awareness. So it's a taboo that radiation going to happen in the product and get it. So we are always in the forum, we talked a lot about it. Let's discuss on the forum, then we'll sit back and do nothing. I think uh, it must be addressed. Next slide, I'm uh, going to address this, how customer awareness is needed and how we can do it. Same with the education to manufacturer and traders also. Even the customer got uh, uh, educated, you cannot move forward until unless the traders want to do it. Ultimately, they are controlling the finance part of it. The next challenge is other harmful practices, which is still massively used, and uh, their residue are coming in the products and really harmful for us. So already there is uh, set guidelines is there, but it's not uh, implemented well, I think, in India. Approval timelines of licensing is faced by the, actually it is facing by the currently running facilities. We'll, uh, then the, why I'm, last line I'm, uh, Saxena sir, I'm mentioning here, I really appreciated what you shown in the brains, but I love to uh, be part of the next level, going to, uh, ahead with the level with the, uh, dry fruits and uh, spices, nutritional changes. And not dry fruits, only in one product, but I will categorically uh, go along with the product by product. The first product will be almonds, figs, dates, and uh, walnuts. Why I'm saying this? Because I uh, invested three years to develop this market. And aggressively, I ran a uh, uh, few companies and approached them. My challenge came to convince them how nutritional values changes when we increase the doses. Like our range is one to five kilogram for microbial decontamination. What changes occurs? So same study, what we did for the cereal and grains, I need in the, so we'll surely work on this. It will help us to make the customer as well as manufacturer aware. So, so uh, my final and uh, I think uh, must needed slide and uh, these points are actually going to decide this coming 50 irradiation unit will be successfully run or not in India. So without going to with these points, I will say uh, even if you go ahead with the plants, their uh, finance part, their profitability, their uh, uh, sustainability going to be questioned because material currently in India is not uh, uh, ready to handle these 50 numbers. So first thing is we need something disruptive campaign which educate customer and trade awareness. I will quote with one example of uh, egg. Sunday or Monday, roj khai ande. You aware? So sabke mind mein hit kar gaya ki what is this? So people started talking about it. So something like that from ministry, some editorials because you know if a government want anything to be get implemented, they be left and right center for everyone, like banks. So, khata kholo, khata kholo. Nahi, inki life li nightmare ho gai hai. Inki haan, hamisa adhar wale rote hai. But, everybody is aware ki, abhi khata kholne se kya ho ga. So, something like, government if want, they want to be, you know, I'm not about, uh, if you just focus and some educational campaign run through government, and we also uh, be part of that, that will surely boost the uh, business in India. And why I'm talking about the strict implementation on restriction, if some technology is banned worldwide and not appreciated in India, why should we continue with that if so harmful? So strictly some uh, measures to be taken uh, immediately to be stop these technologies, which is not uh, beneficial for mankind and human in India. So 
subsidy alone will not help because in the previous slide I saw subsidy only help to reduce the ROI to six, seven years to three, four years. But you have to run the business to attain it. You have to do the quantities. So my next uh, request or suggestion, whatever you think, so Vikram sir is here, he's already 20 years, he's dealing with the, this kind of uh, bulk handling. He already worked a lot. But actually nothing is moved. So my request and our, as a uh, member of association, our con uh, jointly request is to make something uh, uh, like FCI go downs. So if you can just read it, uh, these lines, food grains in FCIs, can we uh, make it mandatory for at least for starting models for one or two FCI go downs, which is near <coughs> to the facility? And we support the transportation part is actually the reduce the spoilage part. And that uh, transportation and uh, irradiation uh, amount can be quantified and equally be uh, seen by the spoilage percentage. So it will get beneficial. Uh, the second thing is large volume communities like grain pulses, millets, and stored onions and potato must be uh, addressed. And like we attended agri, uh, agri industry, they are very concerned about onions because 100 rupees to 150 rupees, whatever the price going in the off seasons. So they want to be get stored for the six to eight months. And how you can achieve it? Only you can if irradiated and stored in a proper channel. So they are ready to give the quantities. So that's the initial discussion. So if we, if government scheme like agri departments come and say we are <coughs> uh, making fix, something about uh, tonnage of a huge 50 metric ton or uh, 15,000 metric ton surely from this unit, then it will, you know, uh, make this uh, business successful. Uh, then again, the in in institutional buyers. As Sir said, uh, already few things are supplied in uh, different uh, institute uh, defense. So why can't it be black and white on paper and uh, some direct uh, tenders to be it? Labeling requirements re need to be relook. Uh, so again, it's uh, related to customer awareness. What happening? We approached many big companies. So I will name. I will not shy about it. Uh, ITC and all. So they don't want to put their labels on the product. Why? Because the competitor and the market they can you know uh, take that leverage to be that his product is irradiated, and irradiation is misguide the consumers. So Indian market is not ready, frankly. So we have to relook. We have to put this redura symbol or not, or we make the education to the education to the customer, educate them that it's a complete safe technology. Because um, making them aware is actually it is required a technical terms. You want to uh, show them the gamma, beta, alpha, all the particles and their charges and what happening to the when it's going to the DNA and all. So public uh, public will not understand. They will understand the simple term. And the last and uh, uh, the D part, again, the, we can, you know, from uh, backhand, if we s support the subsidy for the transportation and all, it will support the uh, processing value as well. And uh, this will help the business. So I think uh, I covered maximum points to make the project successful. <coughs> and by following it, I think uh, ministry what ministry is thinking about this technology, what uh, BRIT is thinking about the technology, what the government, PMO is thinking about technology, we, together we can achieve. It's not impossible. Thank you all. Thank you, Vishak, uh, for highlighting what are the issues actually the industry is facing. Uh, so we'll detail, uh, we'll have uh, question answer sessions. Uh, during that time, we'll discuss all these things. Uh, so sir, now, now it's your time, sir. Uh, uh, the finance person who will be actually financing these facilities. So please welcome uh, Mr. Uh, Santanu uh, from SBI. Good afternoon all. The last man, uh, maybe not the right fit uh, from the technology point of view. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I, I represent SBI. I head the agri vertical of the bank at Carport Center. Uh, with my own balance sheet, more than three trillions. And uh, as you are aware that uh, we, we deal in, I mean, crores of customers. Uh, 
going to what discussions have happened are all technical. I don't have a presentation because I'm a finance guy. I, I, I'm not able to show any technology as such. But we are there for more than 218 years in this country. It, that itself is a technology, I suppose. Is it not? I mean, good weather, fair weather, rough weather, whatever, we have been there and we will be there. Uh, in fact, the, uh, we tell that our uh, balance sheet size is uh, one-fifth of the India GDP. So uh, that's how we serve the country throughout the country. Now, uh, through all these discussions, what we have seen is the technology or the capability of the technology. But I would bring to table certain more points is that unless the consumer prefers or the customer prefers, he or she is the king. I mean, that is why we should build together consumer awareness so that the consumer accepts your eradicated products. This is number one. Number two, what value you bring in the value chain and then at what cost you bring that value in the value chain is of foremost importance. If you are able to convince or we together are able to convince that this is the safe product, we bring value and we bring value at a reasonable cost, then this technology will be accepted, practiced, and then it will, I mean, uh, sky is the limit. So I will just go through first uh, overview of why we do need it, is that we have got largest population, 142 crores. Number two is that there is a huge demand supply gap. Agriculture, as rightly said by all these speakers, has got a seasonality, so there is distinct demand for irradiation. irradiation. Uh, convincing the customers for irradiated food itself may take some time. We have specific, I mean, the country is very, very special that uh, we have such an agroclimatic zone that the microbial growth also is fastest, perhaps in our country, compared to the colder countries. And that is why the uh, need for irradiation is more and uh, the distance from the production uh, to the consumption center is also large because of the country is very large. And if you are thinking of exporting, then uh, irradiation is even more important. Uh, we are also facing a huge climate change risk in agriculture because what, whatever we are talking today is more related to food, fruit, vegetables, uh, which is again susceptible to the, to the climate change because I always keep on saying this in all meetings. My factories, because I am an agriculture uh, vertical head, are in the open. So the climate risk is going to hit me largest. And that is why this radiation is very, very important. Uh, we also have uh, uh, one of the largest vestiges in the country, one and a half trillion rupees we vest in food, fruit, vegetable or crop vestiges which our neighbors don't even produce in a year. I mean, that is why perhaps uh, the Minister of Agriculture has come uh, with a scheme called Agri Infra Infrastructure Fund uh, with a one lakh crore policy support a couple of years back. And we are principal uh, stakeholders. Uh, we do more than 31% of the country's Agri Infra Fund units across the country. And uh, remaining done by all the banks together. Then uh, perhaps we may go to the importance is obviously food safety, extending shelf life, because it again uh, goes, the discussion is going back again to the value chain and the value we, we create. It also will boost our exports uh, substantially uh, with the expansion of irradiation, because today, sir, uh, if my uh, knowledge is correct, uh, we will have more than, not more than 50, 60 plants uh, India-wide as such, government and private taken together. Yeah. So it's a evolving ecosystem. I mean, let me uh, give a comparative uh, this thing because, uh, I mean, the banks are also not used to fund these kind of units because there are very, 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 very few. Uh, 25 or 30 years back, getting a home loan was very difficult. Is it not? 35 years, even I, I used to... I had to struggle uh, with, with my bank or some bank uh, to get a home loan. It was very difficult. Now it is completely democratized, is it not? Even the self-help group ecosystem uh, needed 10 years to mature. And now it is regulation. I mean, 
it, it's an ecosystem of 2.7 trillion uh, rupees, uh, SIG, India's world. Uh, I mean, we are number one in, uh, in this also uh, as a country. Uh, it supports agri-growth directly as well as indirectly because the moment you create value for the farmers or the uh, value in the value chain, obviously the agriculture sector will grow. And uh, I mean, uh, uh, we have got a lot of potential. But uh, one, one interesting point perhaps maybe uh, was raised by one of the speakers is that we must be aware about the competing technologies uh, with irradiation. Because with irradiation, we bring to the table a lot of benefits. But uh, this is a diverse country, and ultimately the customer or the consumer uh, has the final say. So uh, with Agri-Infra Fund, or the, uh, we have almost one lakh um, uh, storehouses or cold storages, uh, whichever way you see. Uh, WDR is uh, bringing up, uh, they have more than 5,000 WDR regulated uh, storehouses or storages or cold storages. So the, this sector is very, very unorganized sector uh, coming into formal. So how do we integrate with these storehouses? Because we may be, and, and uh, one important point which I also uh, want to reiterate is our volume handling capabilities. Unless we have the volume handling capabilities, when we are uh, our one and a half trillion uh, rupees worth fruit, food, vegetable is, is going to be wasted. So unless we bring um, the, the volume handling, uh, it may not be significant uh, in the overall ecosystem as such. Uh, similarly, the cost advantage also. This is a very niche uh, uh, technology and product. So at times, uh, even the bankers struggle while evaluating this project because of the less numbers and, and, and niche technology. Uh, this is because a lot of licenses will be required. And if I can, uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as a banker, if I see it, that one of the largest number of approvals are required in this. Uh, and that is why we need to make it very e easy. Uh, not really? OK, fine. Uh, maybe you have a different perspective. But in my opinion, I think that we need some kind of food safety licenses um, uh, which are required, uh, the environmental and the pollution control license. Uh, not required? Right. And the DAE license. Right. So the DAE license comes automatically after the EERB license. Yes. The typical processing time for all these licenses put together is not more than around. So this is pre construction. Right. Construction what what I what I come to is that uh, while giving this license, mm -hmm. uh, it will be a. I mean, th these licenses will be subset of this uh, ultimate license which you give. Uh, anyway. Uh, as far as the bankers are concerned, we, we, what we do about any project and this project particularly because these are technical, highly niche technical, is the technical evaluation. I mean, what kind of method of irradiation you use, the gamma rays or the electron or the X-rays or the equipment uh, which you bring uh, or import perhaps or indigenous manufacture, uh, the, your process design and the control systems. Uh, to the extent even crisis management or disaster management, should it happen or should there be a chance, uh, then whatever licenses, clearances are required for safety and environmental, obviously that would be required. Uh, uh, this being uh, a very uh, small and niche uh, technology, so we definitely look that. Similarly, the, uh, ultimately the product and the demand, uh, the depth of market, how are you going to deal with your own competitors uh, with the alternate technologies? This is because today most of the cold storages use solar for energy, right? And we only fund them. So uh, talk of UP or northern part of country which has got more uh, number of storage houses, uh, be it Rajasthan, be it Uttar Pradesh. Uh, they are driven by the solar power. So very, very low cost storage houses are there. So we need to see how you compete with them uh, and the competing technologies. 
uh, as far as the cost and the volumes you generate, your capex and opex requirement, obviously uh, the subsidy part or the support part is uh, there, plus the sources of funds uh, from you and and the bank as such or any other. Uh, these are all um, the the uh, what we see as a bank, plus the experience and expertise which the promoters bring to table, their own engagement, involvement in the project, and the commercial angle. I mean, uh, uh, let me be very, very uh, humble and honest is that in addition to being technically very, very capable, you also need to be commercially very, very capable to understand how rupee comes in and how rupee goes out. Otherwise, uh, the units uh, are not sustainable on a long run. Let me be very honest about it. How many or how much amount of technology you involve? There must be a buyer for the value you create and should be able to purchase at the cost you bring to the table. Uh, without that, the unit may not sustain on a longer run. And that is why at times, uh, I mean, uh, some of the projects we are not able to do, uh, very, very honestly. So that's it from my side. I don't want to uh, elongate it, but uh, we know the market and we are there. Thank you, uh, MFP, for, for inviting us. We are integral part of whatever governmental <laughs> Uh, initiatives are there and particularly in the last couple of years we are the largest ecosystem shareholders of government of India initiative be it uh, agri infra fund be it HIDF be it uh, prime minister's FME or or, or whatever uh, as the country's country's largest commercial bank uh, we are there alongside you uh, to support all the units uh, uh, thank you so much Uh, thank you. So uh, we are already uh, we have already crossed that 130 limit, uh, but still I think uh, if we can go for yeah. another 10 minutes. Sure. sure. Okay. Fine. So we'll take some three four questions. Um, uh, so yeah. You can ask. Yeah. Just one second. We'll get you the mics. Yeah, but just for the recording. Hello, uh, my name is Shankar and I travel from Europe and I represent uh, European based companies based in Global South and also an Indian representative in Europe. I have seen the interesting panel discussions from the ideas, implementations and the bankers. And I know that India has signed COP20 Paris agreements and OPEC conferences and in several other terms. And uh, the greatest point there comes is about the sustainability and the carbon commissions, uh, combustions. The whole world emits one part of carbon combustions, and what India emits is in another part. So as a banker, uh, Mr. Shantanu, I have this question for you. What are the banking pressures put to the industries or subsidizing these things? Because uh, industries do emit a lot of uh, carbon combustions in these processes. And are there any specialized means that the bank considers or the banking is only more prioritized to solar consumption industries or such. And uh, secondly, I have a question to Dr. Sanjay Rajput and uh, Saxena, that uh, I know that the average life expectancy in India is somewhere between 65 to 70, correct me if I'm wrong. But whereas compared in European countries, they live a bit longer. And the greater of these effects come with the food what they eat. And in many years' lives, it was mentioned that European Union has banned this irradiation. So I want to understand a bit more, a comparative analysis why Europe has banned on these products if some a global country where the average life expectancy or the health standards are better, I would say a bit, and uh, why India is st still trying to implement more measures on these aspects and what are the environmental aspects in this topic. Thank you. Uh, actually, I, I just want to clear, uh, clarify it. This particular technology doesn't emit any carbon. Okay, so uh, uh -huh. actually, 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 it is a ozone generating plant. It's basically, so uh, the carbon parts per se, it's not applicable. I think the second part of it, uh, I think Gautam, if you can answer, the European uh, uh, are not uh, 
accepting that's why i i told you, irradiation yeah uh, hello yeah so i will tell you this uh, uh, as for the acceptance of the product produce even the my friend from svi what he told uh, see like uh, uh, if you see in the whole global things no scenario uh, us is the country that is maximally accepting fluoridated i will tell you as on today uh, from last seven positively more than consumers industry is more concerned they are telling me put we are doing fumigation we are using pesticides you already know how what what wheat you are consuming that is subjected to the malathion treatment malathion you can google it is a, one of the harmful pesticide ethylene oxide why singapore banned for is because they know the carcinogenic compound so what i am telling but how it goes because you don't have labeling there none of the produce like wheat samples what we are purchasing from market they are fumigated there is no label that's why we are happily accepting it means we want to purchase we don't want to see it so i don't know we want to purchase it we are ready to purchase it we don't want to see it and and that probably not the consumer that the industry is uh, stake so industry i find i'm telling many friends are here from uh, irradiation association of india here like they have to come out the forward to promote the technology many times now government is giving subsidy now you are also telling government also come forward to promote yes government can support it but some risks you also have to take it some risks you promote the product actually the problem uh, gautam uh, the thing uh, is uh, once it is rejected by uh, hong kong or singapore then people comes to know right, that there is right. a eto is a problem right. so otherwise the people in india they they <laughs> Right. easily consume everything right. so that kind of jankari is not there so right. that is most important part of it right. and the and, and and it's our duty to uh, do this uh, honor for the everybody and right. I, i but i'm clear to european question you are something aging related question aging, yeah. so why is their life is longer something like that average life it depends on climate i will tell you the cold climate people in generally uh, then the food habits lot lot of things matter so Uh, irradiation does not have any link with the aging or not aging of the way. <laughs> so that you can i will not tell you take irradiated food your age will go up that also yes. i cannot <laughs> tell you that i cannot tell you that i cannot tell you but yes. that is a little different thing uh, that even india average life expectancy has gone yeah. up your life style your quality of the food what you can but and the medical take, system also yeah. yes. your medical system but i will tell you one thing no whatever one major difference between indian this thing and american like one mango we are exporting you have sense in inspector and they get irate in presence of that and then all it being exported so they believe in the technology we believe partially sometime we believe one go out of the room again you have the doubt okay irate food is safe or not <laughs> why i am telling you have to somewhere you have to accept or reject either accept or reject it and if you are rejecting there should be reason for that okay you okay i think, think we will go to the next question yes. right. yeah yeah, yeah. sir this is manohar bhojwani i welcome mr gautam i am uh, very well uh, connected with uh, with mr gautam very long from uh, uh, nagpur yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, sir my question only is that uh, presently again we are exporting this pulses to us and canada countries again we are fumigating a lot yeah. and again we have done one trial but uh, unfortunately that was not successful due to Uh, our packaging uh, default sir. so now we are uh, one plant is coming up in uh, nagpur itself yes. for radiation yes. so uh, they have taken our pulses sample and they are trying this thing because we are very much interested in this technology because this is very worth yes. now uh, in present scenario, scenario there is a lot of issue is coming of this pesticide residue few of conta our containers are rejected at uh, usa due to this pesticide residue because we are giving a container fumigation then cargo fumigation stacking fumigation all these things and they are bringing the uh, residue over there so, so only question is that whether the us government is permitting uh, this certified uh, US, uh, uh, pulses when we label it yes they permit Yes. Right. Uh, there yes. will be no problem no, no problem no. us canada both U yes they permit uh, only thing is that we have to uh, if we don't put the label any problem then say uh, say no, suppose no, that, you, that you cannot do okay. that you cannot do because okay. 
as per the international WTO agreement, no? Right. And this is right to the consumers. I will tell you, iridescent technology is one of the most honest technology, I will tell you. Right. Because here we are telling, we are going to inform the consumers, not only with the level, we all to also have to write a statement. Okay. It has by iridescent treatment. Right. None other processing has that sort of, I think that is some sort of imbalance playing between the technology. Iridescent more stringently watched and yeah. told. That is the, I think that is the most important no, no problem. Because so you go ahead with that. Then sir, yeah. uh, because what sir we can have the conversation later. Because yeah, okay. there's, there's sir, a session also that no needs problem. to happen no here. Problem. Sir, I have a question for Dr. Gautam, sir. Yeah. Sir, I'm Ashwin from Hyderabad. Sir, when you showed your uh, slides, uh, I could see that in, in the whole of India, this maximum concentration of irradiation units are there in Maharashtra and Gujarat. Gujarat. Correct. So I wanted to know, do these states have acceptance for irradiation? Are the irradiation units uh, are able to come up in those states because the consumers have accepted these units or they're only put up for exports? Now this is the entrepreneur's choice. It is not the consumers. It is not a state-specific acceptance rejection. Most of the people who have understood it they had deployed it and they are getting returned out of that. So it is the entrepreneur's interest, I will tell you. Not the it is Gujarat uh, uh, people are more uh, uh, accepting rated food compared to Andhra. That is not the case. It is primarily the entrepreneur's choice. So initially, I, but one thing I will tell you, BRC being settled in the Maharashtra and Mumbai, they have the ease of, you can say, initially connectivity with us and that's why probably got promoted. That could be possible reason. But now, that's why this plan has come, so that we can have Pan-India presence. Yeah. Most of sir, sir please, we'll take the follow-up question later, because there's a second session needs to happen here. Uh, sir, 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 we, we, are, we are finding that, you know, that after this irradiation, then the supply chain are getting very long. Uh, with the packaging, with the transport, or, uh, and even sometimes the consumer also has to propose the food, you know. So how do you see that, you know, irradiation is going to help? Uh, because, uh, I mean, uh, India is a lot of uh, production in the... Sir, the supply chain management, only this proposal has come. So that, you are, why you have to do a lot of transportation, etc., because facilities are localized in certain part of the country. If it is delocalized all over the country, no, first part of your logistic will be resolved. So your supply will, chain will be more, you can say, strengthened by that. So that was the reason. And as for the nutritional other thing, my the colleague has shown already, Dr. Saxena has shown you the data. So we didn't find, and I think we are doing for last 60 years, we are doing a study on this. So that is not an issue with at all. Yeah. Perfect. I'll, uh, sorry, I have to really cut this short because there's a next session that needs to happen. I'll just quickly extend uh, thank you to all the panelists for this insightful session, uh, especially to Mr. Pradeep for uh, helping us moderate this. And also special thanks to Dr. Gautam who actually helped us uh, sort of organizing and put this session together. Uh, also, uh, thank you to all the panelists. I'll just cut down my thank you show note as well. Uh, uh, but I'm just requesting my colleague to hand over uh, a, a small mementos as in uh, a thank you from uh, all of us. And on behalf of MOFP, uh, thank you for the panelists. Thank you to the audience for this session. Uh, Ishavi, if you could please hand it over to you.